So we are continuing our study of the Psalms, and so if you've got your Bibles, we're in the book of Psalms chapter 14 this evening, and uh, we are going to be, the heading in my Bible says, A Portrait of Sinner. So we're going to be thinking about how we should respond to sin and to the seemingly unchecked sin that runs rampant in our world, right? I don't have to convince you that sin runs sin runs rampant, do I? Um, we can turn on our TVs, we can read the news, we can turn on our social medias, uh, we can go to work and interact with our coworkers and our families and our neighbors, and we see sin uh, running basically unchecked and, and basically um, untethered, right? Sin seems to abound uh, in the world that we live in, right? And so as Christians, I want to ask you this evening kind of to get our, our sort of reflective motors running. How should we respond when we see sin running unchecked in the world that we live in, when we see sin celebrated, when we see sin glorified and touted out as something to be proud of, and as people who are submitted to the Word of God and understand the difference between right and wrong, how should we respond to that in our culture? What do you think? Absolutely. Right. So there is a brokenness, right, that is appropriate, especially when it's people that we love. Right, whether that be people in our own family or our friends or our coworkers or people that we know, right? When they fall into sin or when they are harmed by sin or when they suffer the effects of sin, there's a sadness to that, a sorrow, right, of an understanding of the, the joys and the pleasures and the hope that they're missing out on and what their life could be if they would simply turn to Christ and forsake sin. Right. So there is a brokenness, there is a, a, a sadness and a sorrow that is appropriate. Um, for to, when we see sin uh, all around us. What else? How else should we respond? With the gospel. That's right. As I pray, go. Have the message. What's been us to be saved from sin? And the salvation that comes and the forgiveness that, avail that is available in Christ and the joy and the blessing that is available in Christ. Have the good news. So yes, we should opportunity, actively search out opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those whose lives are being destroyed by sin, right? It's kind of like uh, if someone was drowning and you had a life raft, wouldn't you throw it to them, right? That kind of an idea, right? You would do everything you can, right? Or as uh, was it Spurgeon that said, if people go to hell, they'll go to stepping over our bodies, right, over just uh, holding on to them and begging them to, to repent. And so, uh, so we're confronted with the ugliness of sin in our world. Okay, right? So there is a prophetic role that is appropriate, right? There's a prophetic responsibility we have to name sin, to call sin sin, to declare it to be wrong according to the Word of God, not based on our own authority or our own preferences, but based on the Word of God. We have an, a responsibility to stand up for what is right, to be faithful, to, to uh, actively pursue and, and cultivate what is good and true and right in the world, right? So yes, absolutely. Let me ask you this. Have you ever just felt fed up? Have you ever felt frustrated? Have you ever just thought, what? why even bother anymore? This is ridiculous. I can't handle this anymore. I'm so angry about this, right? There is a appropriate frustration to sin and to its when it's being celebrated in the world, isn't there? A holy anger, right? We want to make sure we're checking our hearts and, and make sure that it's coming from the right place. But when we love the Lord and when we love his word and when we know what's, what's being sacrificed for self and pleasure and sin, right? There is a frustration. There is an anger. And, and I think that is kind of where David is coming from this evening here in Psalm 14. So if you are uh, in the book of Psalms, we're in verse uh, chapter 14. We're going to read these seven verses. And like I said earlier, I just want to make about seven points on these, but uh, we won't drag this out longer than necessary. But um, we want to talk about tonight about particularly about atheism. Um, and you'll see that why that is here when we get into the text. So Psalm chapter 14, beginning in verse one, we'll read the whole thing here. David writes, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never 
understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call on the Lord. Then they will be filled with dread. God is with those who are righteous. You sinners frustrate the plan, but the Lord is His refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of Israel, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Okay. So it's an interesting psalm here. Prayer that David wrote here in response to the rampant sinfulness that he saw in his own world. Right? Now David, of course, was king very early on in the monarchy. Things were relatively good, although I don't think we could say they were great, but they were relatively good during David's reign. But still, when he looked out at the culture, when he looked out at the people, he saw people who lived as if there were no God. Okay? And I think that's important for us to understand here. When he says in the beginning here, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, right? I think we need to understand that these are not atheists the way you and I would think of atheists. Okay? When you and I think of atheism, we think of those who deny God's existence or who, who believe that there is no God, that a, a God does not exist at all, right? Nobody in David's culture would confess that openly, right? In this, in this time frame, everybody believed in God. In fact, you might believe in multiple gods, depending on what nation or culture you were from. So the, the, it wasn't a question of whether God existed or, not, or doesn't exist. The question here is, is God interested in the affairs of human beings, and does he hold people accountable for their actions? Okay, so that's the first point I want to make to you, is that there are two kinds of atheism in the world. There's ideological or philosophical atheism, and there's deistic or pragmatic atheism, right? When I say ideological or philosophical atheism, I'm not talking about the atheism you and I are familiar with, people that would come right out and say, there is no God, right? There is no God, does not is it's a fable, it doesn't address whether it exists or not, and so therefore it is not to be believed. And that exists. We are only some conjunction of chemicals and, and, and biochemicals and things, and so there is no divine at all, period, end of statement. That's more ideological, a more philosophical atheism, right? But there is a deistic or pragmatic atheism, and those are people that would say, well, deism is the belief that God's kind of like a clockmaker, right? He started the world into existence. He kind of got it running, he kicked it off, took his hands off, and is no longer involved with it. So deism is the belief that God is not involved in the daily affairs of human beings. Pragmatic atheism is the belief that God does not hold people accountable, that he does not care about our actions, and that there is no consequences for how we live, whether good or bad. Okay. And so when David looked out at his, his peers there in Israel, right, what he saw was people who were living as if God does not hold people accountable as if their actions bear no consequences, as whether they could live good or bad and it didn't really matter anyway. They would acknowledge God. They would probably even attend temple. They would do the things that the law required in terms of sacrifices and offerings and these kinds of things. But they really didn't believe God had any effect or any kind of real um, <clears throat> interaction with their lives or, or how they lived. Okay, so you see there's, there, there's two kinds of atheism, right? But the point here that I think we need to realize, and this is the second point I want to make from this text, is that all forms of atheism, no matter how intellectually every argument, are moral in nature. Okay? No matter how solid your argument sounds against the existence of God, or how smooth it comes off, the, or how well written it is, or well researched it is, all atheism comes from the will, from a refusal to submit to the one true and living God. Those that would say, well, uh, I just believe in science and I just believe that we're just biochemical organisms and then things are just random, there's no design. Even that, when you peel back the layers like an onion, when you peel back the layers, moral resistance to, to the authority and to the uh, law and, and requirements of God. So all atheism, if you boil it down to the bottom line, is fundamentally moral. And I think that's what we see in our, in our text here. Right? Look at what he says. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. Right? There is no one who does good. Okay? So it's very clear here that there, the reason David says they say in their heart is no, because they act and live as if their behavior doesn't matter. 
They flaunt the commands of God and do exactly what they want to do, and they do not do what God wants to do. They do not obey Him. They do not care about His Word or His law. They live however they, they, their little mind sees fit. They worship at the altar of self, right? So all forms of atheism, no matter how intellectually sound they may, they may appear to be, are fundamentally moral in nature. And I would probably catch some flack for saying that, right? Because nobody who's a sinner wants to say that the reason I don't believe in God is because I don't want to give up my sin. But when we read the Bible, especially when we read over in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, what we see is that the reason people don't want to believe in God is because they don't want to give up their sin. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So when we see sin out in the world, and we see sin celebrated, and we see sin being glorified, and we see sin being justified, what? we can understand that the reason for this is because men and women do not want to submit to the one true and living God and obey His law. That is a moral problem. That is a volitional problem. So it's a problem that goes to a three-letter word called sin. Right? It goes all the way back to the garden. It is the fundamental problem of humanity, a refusal to submit to God. Okay, And that's why it goes on to say here that the Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, if there's any who seek God. Right? So this is the third point I want to make to you, namely that even those who believe in God can sometimes behave as practical atheists. I want you to think about that for a minute. Right? Now these Jewish people that presumably that David is describing people of his covenant. They would have known his law. They would have known the Abrahamic covenant. They would have known the Ten Commandments. They would have known the gone to temple and done the sacrifices. Right? And so they would have confessed, oh yes, we believe in God. We're part of his people. But even those who believe in God can sometimes behave as practical atheists. So let me ask you, how is that possible? How can someone who confesses or would acknowledge, yes, I believe in God, I'm a Christian. How could I say that they sometimes behave as practical atheists? What do you think? That's right. They don't have any consequences or any judgment. That's right. right. When we, when we give in to our sin, and when we do exactly what self and pleasure wants to do, irregardless, of what God has said, when we flaunt what God has said and, and, and treat the consequences of our actions as of no importance, when we fall into sin in that way, we are behaving as practical atheists. In other words, our confession doesn't match our behavior. Right? And I would say that is especially true if we regularly neglect the discipline of prayer. When we regularly neglect the discipline of prayer, we behave as practical atheists. Do you believe that? I think you said it in Sunday school weeks ago that, and I may butcher it, so you have to help me, that when we live in sin or we choose to sin, we are practicing unbelief. Mm -hmm. Did you say that? Uh, I think so. We've been working through Hebrews. Yeah. Sounds like something we would have talked about. We're showing our unbelief mm -hmm. when we live according to God's word. So if that's true, then... Yeah. As if we don't believe God to be who he says he is, mm -hmm. that we don't believe that he will discipline us mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So, I mean, really, we're, we're living as if he doesn't even exist. That's right. That's right. When we sin, we're telling God, I'm better than you, God. Uh, I'm, I'm smarter than you, and I know what my soul needs more than you, and so therefore you can keep your advice, but I'm going to do what I think is right. right? So there's, a, there's an unbelief factor in the sense that I don't believe God is good, that I don't believe that he's at work for my good and for his glory. I don't believe that he loves me. I don't believe that he wants what's best for me, and so therefore I have to take those into my own hands. That's the unbelief factor, right? And unbelief, right, might as well be disbelief, right, in terms of atheistic belief, right? Does God exist? Is He good? And, and does that matter in how you live your life? That is the question, particularly as it relates to the discipline of prayer. Right? When we regularly neglect and regularly ignore the discipline of prayer, we, we act as if we can control our own lives, don't we? Let me just ask you, any of you here good at controlling your own life? Okay, no hands. Good for you, okay? When I try to control my life, it spins out of control in a very quick manner. 
right? Things tend to start falling apart. I like get at odds with my wife, get at odds with my kids, get at odds. I mean, things start to fall apart around my ears when I try to take things into my own hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Spinning on down toward disaster, right? When we regularly commit ourselves to prayer, we're, we're, we are reminding ourselves that we are not fundamentally in control, aren't we? We're reminding ourselves that we serve a God who is sovereign and good and that we are completely and totally dependent on Him. Right? So, so prayer, I believe, is the first and one of the most important aspects of faith, especially as it relates to the habit and discipline of prayer. <clears throat> this is what it says in verse 3 here. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Right? How did they get to, have you ever wondered, how did they get to that point? They neglected prayer. They neglected worship. They neglected obedience. They neglected Bible reading. Of course, they didn't have their own Bibles, but they heard the Bible read at temple. Right? When, when we neglect those fundamental spiritual disciplines, we talked about those, what, now four months ago, five months ago at the end of the year. When we get out of the habits of grace, out of the habits of faith, right? It's amazing how quickly things begin to fall apart, right? How, how quickly sin begins to take over, right? That's why we have to regularly be involved in the disciplines of the faith, prayer and Bible reading and worship. Here's the principle, verse, uh, the fourth point I want to make. What we believe about the existence and character of God has direct and all-encompassing implication for how we live. If we say we believe in God, if we say we believe that He is sovereign and that He is good and that He is holy and that He is just and that He, he punishes sin, if we believe those things, then we will live in, 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 in accordance with them. Right. So how then do how then do we do we justify the cognitive disconnect? Right. Because I know a lot of people that would confess those truths and yet live in exactly the counter counterintuitive way. Right. How do we tolerate that kind of cognitive dissonance? That kind of disjunct between what we say we believe and how we live. How does that occur? I mean, how do we how do we justify that? What do you think? Okay, so that's one aspect. Maybe we overemphasize some of the God's attributes in, in exclusion to others. Well, God is a God of love, and He's a God of grace, and He's a God who forgives, and so therefore I can go on sinning you regardless, and He will still forgive me. Right? And that's an abuse of grace we read about in the book of Romans. Right? Maybe the problem is our faith is intellectual, but we haven't applied it morally and practically. Right? And I struggled with from this when I was a teenager. Right? I love studying theology. I love studying the rich truths of the faith and, and learning these deep, rich, intellectual doctrines. Right? But we have to take the next step and apply them morally and practically and transformationally. If our faith is here and not down here, then we're not being obedient. Right? Christian faith is more than what we believe in our heads. Right? Christian faith is a matter of trust. Do I trust in the God who I know to be good and loving? Okay. I trust that He has my best interest at heart. Do I trust that His Word and His law is the best way for me to, to accomplish human flourishing? Right. Do I believe that here by way of intellectual assent, or do I believe it here by way of trust and devotion and submission? So what we believe about the existence and character of God has direct and all-encompassing implications for how we live, especially, let me put it this way, especially for how we relate to one another. When we read in this text here in verse 4, we can see that a lot of the, the, the corruption here is relational, isn't it? Verse 4 says, Will evildoers never understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call. In other words, their, their sin had consequences on the people that they interacted with on a daily basis, especially those who were less fortunate and did not have the same kind of means and resources. Right? They took advantage. They oppressed. They treated unfairly others who were made in the image of God. Right? Now, if we 
of what the Bible says about God, about how He's a particular friend to the widows and the orphans and the strangers, and that how He cares for the brokenhearted and how He cares for those who are sudden, right? If He cares for those people, then it would make sense that we would care for those people. And if we don't, if we treat them unfairly or treat them harshly without grace and mercy, then we, we, we <clears throat> insult God and, and basically act as if He doesn't exist. This is why Jesus said, insofar as you've done it unto the least of these. You remember that passage, Matthew 25? Insofar as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Right? It's amazing that you can tell someone's character by how they, but most clearly by how they treat the least of these. Proverb over in the book of Proverbs that said basically, uh, basically you can tell what kind of person someone is and how they treat their dog and cat. And I'm paraphrasing. That's a proverb over there. Right? Point being is how we treat the vulnerable, how we treat the weak, how we treat those who are not able to pay back is a direct revelation of what we believe about God and His character. If we believe that He holds accountable those who mistreat the weak and the vile, then we will not treat them harshly. Right? How we treat others is a direct, relation, direct reflection of what we believe about God. And that's why Jesus said the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God and love others as yourself. Right? Our faith is not some individualistic, private, pietistic kind of just me and God thing. Right? What we believe about God has direct implication on how we impact and how we relate to others. Okay? So <clears throat> we continue. Uh, next point I want to make is this. What people revere... They resemble either for ruin or restoration. Why don't you think about that? What people revere, or what they worship, if you will, what people revere, they resemble either for ruin or restoration. This is the thesis of a book entitled We Become What We Worship, A Biblical Theology of Idolatry by G.K. Beale. Right? Point being, what we worship, we will become. If we worship self, if we worship the God of self and the God of pleasure and the God of entertainment, then we will be like these fools that we are reading about here. We will become more selfish, more prideful, more hateful. But if we truly love and worship God, truly adore Him, then we will we become more like Him, our character. And I think that's the problem here in this verse. Right? They don't they don't, they don't they don't submit to His ways. They don't try to uh, worship. They say in their heart there is no God. Their hearts were not devoted to Him. And so therefore they became hateful and callous and harsh and greedy and selfish rather than becoming like God. <clears throat> Point six. There will be a day when the existence of God will be undeniable and unavoidable. Look at verse five. Then they will be filled with dread. For God is with those who are righteous you sinners frustrate the plans of the oppressed, but the Lord is His refuge. Right? Then. In other words, as, as David is praying through this, the, the, these people that he sees, this. I can't fix this. I can't change people's hearts. I can't cause them to submit to God and act according to His law. But one day, they will have to give an answer. One day, every human being will stand before God. Right, Philippians 2 says, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow that Jesus is Lord. Right? One day there will be no more right? right? One day God will reveal his, his, uh, his presence in power and glory when Jesus comes again. And on that day, everybody will know that Jesus is Lord. Right? And those, those who have lived their lives as if God is interested and not involved in the daily affairs of their lives and cares about how they live or, live or behave... They will be sadly mistaken on that day. They will be filled with dread, verse 5, right? For God is with those who are righteous. And that's the flip side of the coin, isn't it? That for those who have trusted in Christ, for those who have walked in accordance to His ways, for those who have lived in honor and devotion of Him, that day will be a great celebration, right? A great vindication. That's why he goes on to pray here in verse 7. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion, when the Lord restores the fortunes of His people, let Jesus, let Israel be glad. Right? The victory of God is something to be celebrated. The vindication and exaltation of uh, the Son of God is something to be anticipated and, and worshipped. Right? That's a good, good thing for those of us who are His people. 
But for those of us who are not his people, that is a terrifying thing. Right? It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So for the seventh point here I want to make, if God is who he says he is, then the reasonable response that we can, might have is to submit and serve. If the God of the Bible is who he says he is, if all of the things that we read about the Bible, or read about God in the Bible are true, then the most reasonable is to submit, repent, and obey. Right? Now, if this book is wrong, if there's any element of this book that is not accurate or incorrect, then he is not to be trusted, even if he does exist. But if every aspect, every affirmation of this book is true and good and right, then the only proper response is to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Right? And that's what these people missed. <clears throat> so, let me ask you. How do we live in such a way that reveals what we believe about who God is and what He requires? How do we do that on a daily basis? Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Several weeks ago in my Sunday school class in the first part of Hebrews chapter 11, we were talking about, it says, by faith we believe that God created the heavens and the earth or something to those effects and how that this is one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is the first principle of a Christian worldview. Right? It starts with God. The Christian worldview, the Christian way of understanding the world begins with God. It doesn't begin with humankind. Right? God existed, God created, and it was good. Right? And if we believe that, if that is the first principle of our worldview, then yes, we will we will avail ourselves of his wisdom. If he created humanity and he knows what's best for humanity, then the best thing we can do is ask him what he thinks is best for us. Right? So do what he says, even if we don't like it. Right? So yes, absolutely. Giving ourselves to his revealed word. Living in obedience, being transformed by it, trying to live according to it. Those kinds of things. What else? How else does our behavior reveal what we believe about God? Go ahead, Tori. Absolutely. I've been reading through Psalm 119. It's one of my favorite texts, right? In Psalm 119, every verse drips with the psalmist's devotion and saturation with the Word of God, right? 186 some verses of adoration and devotion and saturation with the Word of God. Clearly, that was what was inside of him, and it's what came out of him. And so you're exactly right, Tori. When we interact with others in, in outside in the world and in our workplaces or in our families or gatherings or whatever— what are we talking of? What are we celebrating? What are we laughing at? What are we most excited about? Right. And there's plenty to be excited about in the world, but, but is God our first thought? Right, in that way. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, that's, that's just exactly what I was going to say, but in another way that it reveals priorities. Mm -hmm. What matters, mm -hmm. right? Is self and pleasure and what I want matter more than God and who He is and what He wants to do? Or vice versa, right? Right. So it just really reveals the heart mm -hmm. and priorities. That's right. And to, I was going to say earlier, you said, how do we justify knowing and claiming mm -hmm. them living mm -hmm. contrary? To mm -hmm. And you also mentioned Romans 1, 2, and 3 earlier. Right? You have to suppress the truth. Yeah. When you're living in contrary to the yeah. God. And therefore, living like somebody that does not believe in God, yeah. which then shows the priorities. And I can speak well to that because I have been that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I've been that guy that it's easy 
can't justify your sin unless you're suppressing the truth. That's right. And unless you're not in prayer, unless you're not seeking wisdom, right. unless you're not surrounding yourself with godly people that will hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, if you're not doing it, you're just suppressing the truth yeah. and living unrighteous. Yeah. Jeremiah 31 says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Right, that we are we are experts at deceiving ourselves. Right, the heart is an expert at deceiving ourselves. Right, and so we don't want to be deceived. We turn to the truth. Right, and we don't have the truth. Our emotions are not the truth. Our feelings are not the truth. God's word is the truth. Right, so absolutely. Any other thoughts? This is a this is a freebie. You get this one for free. It's not even part of the my points. But turn your turn your over to Psalm uh, Psalm fifty three. Hold your finger in fourteen, and turn over to chapter fifty three. Psalm fifty three. I'm just going to read Psalm 53. It's only six verses. Let's hear what it says. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt and they do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Well, evildoers never understand. They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call on God. Then they will be filled with bread, dread like no other. Because God will scatter the bones of those who besiege you, you will put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion when God restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. You notice any similarities there between Psalm 53 and Psalm 14? All right. It's not exactly verbatim, uh, it's, but it is almost exact replica or exact repetition of what we are just read in Psalm 14. Again, this one's still by David. For the choir director, okay. The biggest difference is here in Psalm 53, where Psalm 14 uses the covenant name of God, the Lord, in capital letters. Psalm 53 uses the more generic term, God, right? Um, that's in keeping with this particular section of the Psalms. They typically use the term God more than they use the, His covenant name. And then the biggest difference, of course, being in verse 5, which reads a little bit differently than what we have in verse 14. But apart from verse 5, this verse is almost a verbatim, almost a verbatim repetition of what we have in verse 14. Now, we believe there are no mistakes in God's Word, and we believe that God doesn't waste breath or waste words, okay? So this is the Word of God, and typically when you're studying the Bible, if something's repeated, you ought to key up and take notice. So let me ask you, why did David write this prayer twice? Okay, it's important. Why is it important? It's easy to be a fool. That's right. That's right. Any other thoughts? I think it's because sin is a real serious matter. And the power of sin to deceive, the power of lust and self and pleasure and greed to consume is sometimes more than you and I can battle on our own, isn't it? If we're not on guard, if we ever relax, if we ever become apathetic, boy, the God of self comes right, rushing right back in, doesn't it? Sin is a real problem. And as this world continues to cycle forward, it will continue to be a real big problem. And I think the biggest problem, one of the, of course, a lot of problems we could identify, but one of the biggest problems in the church today is we don't, we don't treat serious, sin as a serious problem. Right? I think it was Bonhoeffer, but don't hold me to that, but it said that there is no area of human life over which God does not call mine. Right? You understand in your life there is no distinction between what is sacred and what is secular, or what belongs to God and what belongs to me. Every aspect of your life belongs to God, right? From the shoes you put on in the morning, right, to the coffee you drink, right? Every aspect of it is an opportunity to honor God and submit to His Word, right? And so we do ourselves a disservice 
when we divide those things in our minds. I'm real good at compartmentalizing. I'm real good at saying, okay, Sunday, church over here, that's where I worship God. That's where I do the, the God thing. And then over here uh, at home, I do the home thing. And then over here at work, I do the work thing. And those are not related. I'm real good at that, right? And I catch myself having to repent of that because my devotion to God should saturate every aspect of my life, right? Every, every interaction, every relationship, every decision, every word, right, should honor God. And so I think that's why David, looking out at the world, and I, again, we don't know when these were written, if they were written in close succession or separated by many years. We don't know that. But sin is going to continue to be a problem until Jesus comes again, both for us and for those we love and for the communities we live in and for this world. Sin is going to continue to be a problem. And if we ever become apathetic, and if we ever give up, and if we ever stop praying, and if we ever stop sharing, and if we ever stop serving and obeying, then we'll be consumed. That's why Paul says constantly, be on guard, be alert, be on watch, right? Be vigilant, right? Stand up, keep your eyes open, those kinds of things. Sin is a real problem. Right? And it's not to be taken lightly, not to be treated as, as, as if it has no consequence, because our, our sin does matter. Jesus Christ gave his life for it. And we are called to live in obedience and repentance and obedience, aren't we? So the, the seemingly unchecked rampant sinfulness in the world may cause us to question the existence and character of God. But instead of giving in to despair, we should turn to God in both lament and hope. I think that's what this psalm teaches us. We should turn to God in both lament and in hope. Yes, brokenness, sorrow over sin and its consequences, but also hope in, because we understand that sin is not going to win. One day sin will lose. One day Jesus will come again and sin will be done away with completely. So we can lament and we can have hope and we can hold those together in tension. And I think that's what this psalm teaches us. What about you? What are your takeaways from this Psalm 14 and 53? We looked at together but briefly, but what are your takeaways? What do you think about this psalm, in particular, what does it teach you about prayer? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And doing nothing. Yeah. 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 And sometimes we don't realize that quick enough, do we? Right. Yeah. So repentance is primary important, right? It is the primary, one of the primary disciplines, those disciplines of the Christian faith we talked about, right? One of the parts of the discipline of prayer is to repent of our sin and confess it to God and turn from it daily, right? The habit of daily repentance. I agree with that. What else? What other takeaways? Yeah, these vo these verses are quoted in Romans chapter three. Yeah, yeah, when he's talking about the sinful humanity and the ultimate condemnation of sin, right? That's where he quotes all. There's a string of quotations there in chapter three, verses about ten to twenty, and then verse twenty three says, "You know it, for the wages of sin is death." Right. So yeah, when Paul is describing our salvation and our need for it, he goes back to these verses because sin is a it was a problem. David's time, and guess what? It was a problem a thousand years later in Paul's time, and it's a problem today, two thousand years later, the same problem. As much as the world has changed, the problem of sin has stayed, has stayed the same from for the entire history of humanity. A refusal to submit to the acknowledge and submit to and acknowledge the authority of God. Yeah. Sin being successful for a season. 
Yeah. 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 They all say in, uh, you know, sin will keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Sin is fun for a short time, isn't it? The play, the temporary pleasures are, are real, real good for, for a season, but it ain't worth it in the long run, is it? Right. And so when we begin, we have to learn to cultivate that eternal perspective. Right. Paul says in Colossians, set your minds on things above, on the things that are eternal, not on the things that are temporary and the things that are, are, are passing away, so to speak. Right. What kind of pleasures are we looking for? Eternal pleasures or temporary pleasures? Yeah, so we have to learn to discern that in our own lives, don't we? We have to learn when we're giving ourselves to those temporary pleasures and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not satisfying. This is not fulfilling. This doesn't, this doesn't provide me joy that I know is available in Christ. Right? We need that kind of discernment in our own lives, right? Absolutely. What else? Any other thoughts here on these Psalms? Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. We have a responsibility to share the good news, don't we? All right. I think uh, in, in addition to that, what you said about prayer, um, prayer is one of the primary means we have in the battle against sin, isn't it? In the battle against our own sin, in the battle against temptation, in the battle against the deceptiveness of our own selfishness and greed. When we are in prayer for the big things and the little things, like Kara said, then we'll find that we have the strength to withstand those temptations more easily, right? When we're submitted to God and relying on His strength rather than relying on ourselves. Right? So we, and we'll see that in Ephesians chapter 6 when we get to spiritual warfare, that one of the primary tools we have in spiritual warfare is prayer. Right? And that's why I think, and the other aspect of that is too, is that God is the only one who can change hearts. That's why prayer is our primary tool in battling against sin. God is the only one who can change hearts. No matter how much I argue, no matter how much I persuade, no matter how much I beg, I can't force somebody to submit to Christ. Only God can do that. And that's why I have to be in Constant in prayer for the big things and the little things, like you said. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's spend the final moments here in prayer.